Let's get close but not so close Welcome to episode 56 of Quarantine, the 56th time we've convened since we all went home and dodged because um, we were in a state of viral quarantine. Uh, oftentimes in quarantine, we say that it's a new season. This time really does feel like a new season since we have a new administration and in many ways a new start. On last week's show, when we were discussing democracy, disinformation, and deplatforming, giving ourselves Ds. In the middle of that show, word reached us here in California that then-President-elect Biden had announced a new science advisor, the first science advisor that comes from the life sciences world. And not only that, it was to be a full cabinet position. Really, for the first time since President Roosevelt, the person who would lead science in this country would be sitting next to the president. And, and at that time, Biden invoked that first science advisor, Vannevar Bush, a legendary person who led big science during World War II, was responsible for the focus on radar, the atomic bomb, the proximity fuse, much of early computing. Uh, and at the end of the war, the president asked him to write a report. What should America's science agenda be as it transitions to peace? And he wrote his legendary report, The Endless Frontier. Uh, which which drove American science for years. And what the president said is, I would like to go back to that original report where FDR laid out some priorities, and he charged Eric Lander, the new science advisor, to take just as broad a cut at things. And it got us to thinking, um, this is pretty remarkable. We have a president whose focus is on science, scientific method, and the fact, facts. A president who who is actually elevating this and creating kind of a national agenda and conversation. And this whole notion of a frontier is very deep in the American story, right? We are always a, a, a nation about progress, about expanding. Uh, in frontier showed up in Kennedy's language, in Reagan's language. And now it's coming back. And the thing we realized is if there was, a, if there was an endless frontier of science in 1945, Holy moly, it's exponentially more today when you think of quantum computing and it's, uh, computational biology and all of the things we're getting into. And that's what today's show is about. Uh, let's welcome our co-host, Mickey McManus. Today, Mick, we're going to dig into the history of science policy and talk to scientists who are inventing today's endless frontier. Uh, what an amazing way to start a season with a new administration. Yeah, I am. Um... I will say, I mean, I was incredibly uh, concerned and worried when science was challenged uh, and the basic facts of the world were being challenged. Uh, I'm a big fan of scientists. I'm not one. My mom was a biologist. Um, my grandmother was an electron microscopist. Um, but, you know, I, I just I felt like I can't believe this. And my, my brother's a physicist. So I, I sort of like was raised with science was like a good thing. It was good for humanity. It was good for us. Um, and knowing the world was a better way to, to reach and understand the universe and, and appreciate it and fall in love with it. So, um, so when we saw that, um, that, uh, that uh, President Biden uh, uh, name checked Vannevar Bush and, uh, and also you know, really said, uh, we're gonna really um, take seriously the idea that, that there could be facts and truth and phenomena uh, that aren't uh, mine or yours. I got very excited. So, so today, um, uh, I just read both the original paper, but also um, uh, the head of DARPA, Artie Prabhakar. Uh, Artie is probably one of the best uh, DARPA leaders in the world, uh, uh, or in in the administration that has ever been. Uh, who who um, 
really impacted me quite a lot, you know, understanding what they call the department of strategic surprise. How do we surprise ourselves before uh, an adversary, maybe it's COVID, surprises us? And um, she wrote an update on the 70th anniversary of Van Iver Bush's, uh, Van Iver Bush's uh, uh, effort. And, and, and I got super excited by it because it was called In the Realm of the Barely Feasible. And it was about this notion that we actually have to tackle so many things, but we, there's a methodology that we can that we can look at that's sort of solution based, not not tech based. It's not about a technology looking for a nail. It's a hammer looking for a nail. It's about look at a critical need, what they call pastures quadrant, uh, solve something that has a critical unmet need and a critical use but push the limits of science to actually help us do that. And it's a, it's a really interesting space that, that we don't hear too much about yet. So in any event, um, we've got this amazing group of guests that we've invited today, including uh, uh, the official biographer and uh, of uh, Van Iver Bush's biography. Uh, and so I think maybe what we should do is just jump in. Let's, let's have them all come let's on. Let's introduce to everybody. Um, first, uh, let's meet, uh, G. Pascal Zachary, uh, you and I knew each other in the 80s when I was at Apple Computer and you were covering us in the news. You're now an historian on science and policy. Yes, and Vannevar Bush is um, both the author of Science of the Endless Frontier Re Report, but in the 1930s, he was the world's uh, leading computer designer electromechanical computers. So the connection between politics, uh, policy, and computing, it was always very strong in him. But thank you for having me on and for letting me join in to this important uh, discussion. Zach, you'll Thanks be our joining. first Let's, guest. Yeah. And then we have three scientists. So Mick, why don't you introduce us to our frontier? Oh yeah, here's some frontier. Uh, let's bring in uh, uh, Megan and, and Mandy. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello. Megan, who are you? Just a sentence or so. And what, what is synthetic biology? Just a, a quickie. And we'll go back to, to you later, but just sort of the way you see the world. Sure. Um, so currently, I'm the executive director of biopolicy and leadership initiatives at Stanford University. And I'm also an adjunct professor in Stanford University's Department of Bioengineering. And I'm actually a bioengineer by training, but I've spent the last decade or so operating at this interface between advances in biological science and engineering and sort of the policy nexus writ large. How do we ensure that that these innovations and being able to, you know, learn to, to program living systems, which is really what synthetic biology is, is all about, how do we ensure that they're actually benefiting people and the planet? Wow. Okay. And uh, Mandy, a sentence about who who are you and what is the crazy thing you're doing in quantum? What is what is that? <laughs> well, I'm Mandy Birch. Um, I'm an engineer by background, mechanical engineer, and uh, I'm out in Berkeley, California now at a venture back startup, and we're building uh, quantum computers. And quantum computers are a cutting edge computational capability that helps ac accelerate. Uh, computing, high performance computing uh, that, that um, is really essential to science and technology in the future. So I think, um, you know, quantum computing is one of these frontier technologies is just really exciting to be a part of and, and help make um, advances in a really important area. So what I'm really excited about, um, and Mandy, you gave us a tour and we were able to actually look at a quantum computer. It was like a giant refrigerator and the only energy it was taking was basically keeping it cool. Um, yet, uh, if it can get to the point where it's actually useful, and, and of course, quantum is a frontier that's a little farther out there, um, you know, for the cost of running a refrigerator, uh, it could do the equivalent of like, you know, a, a city block or a, or a, or a, or something the size of a small city in terms of the current way that we compute things with classical computing. And one of the things you guys have been doing is looking at the intersection of classical computing and quantum, and, and as a small startup, challenging some of the biggest industry players, IBM and Google and, and Microsoft, to say, actually, we're pretty scrappy. We're going to work on every aspect of this. So very exciting. I mean, I, I got to hold a, 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 
a qubit processor in my hand that you you refit a, an old silicon factory to, to build. So super exciting. We'll get back into that later. But that's a frontier that could intersect with biology and computational biology in really fascinating ways to compute, you know, what the way that the uh, you know, a molecule binds nitrogen, you know, the Haber-Bosch process, uh, just to understand just the number of those molecules and how they work together could take a massive supercomputer a long time just to understand it. And with quantum, the promises, it could be like the afternoon, not waiting for the heat death of the universe to calculate it or something. So, so super exciting. And then um, we will have Gary Marcus, who uh, is sort of an infant terrible. I don't know. I'm totally bastardizing that word, but but he's sort of been uh, one of the most important parts of science is when orthodoxies get stuck in local minima. They get stuck thinking this must be the truth. We have to have people to say, is that is that a dead end? Is that is that really the right way to do it? And he has led massive debates about AI and is it actually doing anything interesting the way humans actually compute and have creative intelligence. And so he'll be joining us. We have a recorded clip from him from yesterday. He wasn't able to join live uh, near the end of the show. So thank you for joining uh, and, and we'll bring you back up in a little bit. Zach, let's start with, uh, with, with you. And maybe you can give us a little bit of an overview of who Vannevar Bush was and this amazing management thing he did as he commanded essentially the national science establishment around World War II and, and did this balance between applied research and, and figuring new things out that just, he was considered the general, the science general of World War II. Well, it's hard to remember that the U.S. in 1940 was a backward country, both militarily and in science and technology. Most of our great scientists went to Germany to study and um, our oceanographers went to Europe and the locus of scientific uh, knowledge was in, was in Europe. Um, Bush recognized that the United States needed to advance its military capabilities and to organize its scientists and engineers to prepare for what in the spring of 1940 looked like either the defeat of the democratic countries in Europe by Germany or the entry of the U.S. into World War II. And so he uh, spoke with Franklin Roosevelt. Bush was at the time the chair of a philanthropic organization called the Carnegie Institution of Washington. It's again hard to imagine, but in 1940, the entire research budget for the physics department at Columbia, which was a leading physics center, was $2,000. American science had virtually no money, and the little money it had was provided by foundations. Carnegie Institution was one of those, uh, formed uh, part of the legacy of Andrew Carnegie. And so Bush was in Washington, D.C., running the most influential uh, research organization that wasn't associated with the university. And on his board was Franklin Roosevelt's uncle, Frederick Delano. And Roosevelt, of course, Franklin Roosevelt was comfortable with intellectuals, artists. And um, Delano arranged for a meeting in the spring of 1940. And at that meeting with Franklin Roosevelt, Bush came prepared with a plan. And the plan had a central mechanism, research for contracts, research for money, that scientists wouldn't work for the government directly, they would be independent, they would stay in their homes, but the government would pay them and they would be paid for their effort, not their outcomes. At the time, government finance was based on a different notion of accountability, not effort, but results. Um, Bush also at the time was the head of the NACA, which was the predecessor of NASA and the most important aviation research facility in the US. To this day, 
NASA Ames in um, Mountain View, right off of 101, um, is a legacy of that. Uh, Bush visited that uh, testing ground, and American planes were far, far inferior to German planes. So in the spring, in June of 1940, Roosevelt says that uh, he has named Bush his czar. Uh, Roosevelt had these czars, and uh, Bush was his science and technology czar. Bush was not a scientist. He was an applied mathematician. Uh, his PhD was in math, and he was an electrical engineer as, at MIT and in his own work in computation. So he is charged with helping the armed forces, which were then only the Army and Navy, to enhance and mobilize and bring new technologies on board. And we, we know the results were pretty astonishing, both in terms of radar, which helped um, both the Navy track German subs and the Army Air Corps uh, also shoot these subs and, and also do better in their, in their bombing raids against Germany. And then there was another major... Uh, in innovation called the proximity fuse, which made bombs more destructive. Now, it of course troubled Bush that the destructive capabilities of science were highlighted by World War II. None more highlighted than the race to build an atomic weapon. By default, Roosevelt turned to Bush to organize the Manhattan Project, and Bush uh, selected Robin Oppenheimer as the technical lead, and uh, Bush did not like the Navy. He felt the Navy officers were arrogant, and he cut out the Navy from the bomb project. He chose the Army, and in part because the Army War Secretary, Henry Stimson, who was a Republican, as was Bush, uh, he got along well with Stimson, and he thought Stimson understood the importance of bringing elite scientists to bear on the problem of harnessing atomic weapons. So I think this is, um, I'm curious, you know, I think this is really interesting that, of course, you always imagine historic figures, you know, and, and you imagine that they, um, you know, that they made the best possible choice from some scientific vantage point or from all the facts. But it also is very relationship based. I mean, you know, okay. Well, that's right. That's right. The relationship with Roosevelt was cru crucial. Yeah. Roosevelt left not a single document endorsing the bomb project. There's only one scrap of paper in which he writes on a piece of paper, okay, FDR. That's how FDR approved the bomb project. Yeah. There were no public hearings, nothing like that. Now, by the end of the war, when the bombs go off in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and Bush was part of the targeting committee, Vannevar Bush was part of um, the decision that Truman made. He was part of the so-called interim committee that advised Truman to use the bomb. It was clear already that scientists would become part of the war machine. They would become part of decision-making around how to apply science to war. This troubled Bush because by 1945, the end of 45, early 46, fears of a global nuclear holocaust from unrestrained atomic development had begun to cast a dark shadow over science. And in fact, by 1966, Barry Commoner, a famous environmentalist, but who began as a health scientist, wrote a book called Science and Survival. And there were many people who felt that science might be antithetical to human uh, thriving and might actually lead to the extinction of humanity. And we all remember Carl Sagan, global, uh, the uh, uh, global winter. And so in part to offset this new doubt about the utility of science, FDR, before he died in April of 1945, asked Bush to come up with a plan 
for peacetime uses of science hmm. because it troubled the Democratic Party and many liberal leaders in the country that science was only associated with destruction. And yet science had only begun to flower in America. So Bush comes up with a report um, that was released paradoxically just weeks before Hiroshima. In July, a few weeks after Bush had witnessed the Trinity test in the deserts of New Mexico, he releases this report. By then, Truman is now president. Roosevelt has died of his many health issues. And Bush is now thinking that he's lost the special relationship that he had with the president. And normal politics is now returning to the United States. Uh, a number of senators, especially one from West Virginia named Harley Kilgore, had began openly agitating that science had become a captive of the military. It had become pledged to forces of destruction. It was a dark factor in human civilization and that everyone began fearing science. So couldn't there be something done good by science? So part of the endless frontier was to demilitarize science, to turn science back toward the altruistic aims, which many uh, civilian scientists, including Oppenheimer, wanted. Zach, um, the president was, gave, it, it, in this report, uh, I believe the president did the president charge Bush with four priorities or did Bush come back with four priorities? There was a well, Bush, Bush wrote up those questions. So formally Roosevelt sends him a letter asking how can science help prosperity? How can science help employment? Because remember at the end of the war, the presumption was the depression would resume. Hmm. Mass unemployment in America was only ended by World War II by the enormous productive needs of the war. And the fear was, we're going back into a depression. So wow. there was hmm. prosperity. There was the promotion of knowledge, health. Bush had proudly presided over the mass production of penicillin in World War II, which was a breakthrough of enormous hmm. importance because while penicillin had been used and known, it was a very difficult to master technology to mass produce it. Suddenly we had antibiotics and we began longer life. And so there was this sense in the late forties that the biomedical field was poised for a big breakthrough. Remember, there was only the National Cancer Institute, a tiny institute formed in the late thirties um, there was a vast area for health. And who was Bush's biomedical chair during World War II? George Merck uh, of Merck. Bush became chairman of Merck after World War II because George Merck trusted him. And he did die, George Merck, um, at a young age. And Bush became the chair of Merck into the 50s. It was a very important job. Merck was, in many ways, the most important American pharmaceutical company. So the Actually, question- I want to stop you there. I'm, I'm curious, yeah. um, uh, you know, in this arc, and of course, you know, you say, of course, we remember this. Of course, I don't know this. And I, I'm just shocked with everything you're saying because I don't know it. Um, yeah. What's the name of the book? What's the name of the, the, the book you wrote that is- Well, that I is wrote a biography of Bush. There had never been one. And I wrote the one and only biography called, uh, I do call it Endless Frontier, and Vannevar Bush, Engineer of the American Century. And we should talk for a moment about the notion yeah. of the frontier. Yes. Uh, oh, the historian yeah. Frederick Jackson Turner in 1890 wrote a famous essay about the closing of the American geographic frontier. And hmm. Bush seizes upon this. Bush was actually a quite uh, serviceable writer, and he seizes upon this term because Bush himself wrote the summary to the report, and he chose the title, Science, the Endless Frontier. Hmm. And in the 30s, engineering and science is attacked as causing the depression as wiping out employment. 
And so there was a subterranean movement in the 30s to look at how knowledge was a new frontier. And so Bush hits upon the notion of science, the endless frontier. Um, you have to remember that colonialism was essentially dealt a blow by World War II, not the final death blow, but the British Empire it begins to dismantle, the French colonies begin to dismantle. And so when we thought of the globe as a frontier for European countries and or the United States for the continent, now that um, land and the conflicts around land were seen as passe, outmoded. So Bush, when he comes out with his report in 1945, he wants to have a research foundation funded by the government that gives scientists money, time, and organization. Hmm. Money was very, very important to Bush. He felt that scientists deserved a reward for their low pay and long hours during World War II. Hmm. Second, he said that science and scientific knowledge was like a seed corn that we had exhausted during World War II, and we needed to rebuild it. In addition, he worried that the vast number of European scientists, obviously Zillard, Einstein, Niels Bohr, an endless number of them had come from Europe and essentially rescued the United States from scientific backwardness, that these people would need to be replaced and they might have to be replaced by actual Americans. And so a big part of science, the Endless Frontier Report was saying, we must start paying for education. Because wow. in 1950, there were very few large public universities, and they were relatively small. Uh, so, it, you know, it's interesting the way you, you're, you're explaining this, because, you know, I think a lot of us just take all this stuff you just mentioned for granted. We take it for granted that we well, have invested well, yeah, in these amazing sure research universities. I think someone yeah. who's 85 might know about this, but yeah. But the well, and can, we, can, we bring up, can we bring up the cover of the book uh, just to show uh, the the, the well, book? Very that, yeah. you. Bush Perfect. was a patrician from Massachusetts, hmm. and remember, he lived and worked in a world where everyone was a white man, hmm. and even the research community even as late as the early 60s, was virtually all white men. I mean, what's interesting here is this was a, he, he did a magnificent job of curating top-down kind of centralized control. So, I mean, it was, one thing that's amazing is he that's placed right. great bets. He seemed to have great management prowess and the stuff he put in place was work. We're very lucky for it. And it was of another era, right? Because he wasn't letting contracts he wasn't looking for great diversity. He picked the guys he figured could get it could get it right. Um, get it right fast. Yeah. And so actually, I'd love I'd love to um, I'd love to bring on our next guest, uh, uh, Megan, uh, as an example of what's happening today, and then we'll we'll circle back to you to kind of have a conversation because I think I think she may even have some reaction to to just hearing a little bit about that history, and and I, I suspect Megan, you're. You're pretty steeped in this too, but it's so fun to hear it, you know, in, the, in this visceral way. Like, you learn so much like? from the history, and you know, you learn something new every time. And I think a lot of the assumptions that we take for granted, as you said, about you know what what science's purpose was, what science and engineering was for. Uh, a lot of young scientists and engineers that that I work with, they don't understand, especially some of the the wartime history and some of the notions um, that are really embedded in in our institutions that then now we have the time to, to reconsider and, and really rethink. So Megan, tell us a little bit about yourself and 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 what your mission is, what your passion is right now. And, uh, and, and maybe after telling us a little bit of that, and I'm sure Peter has some questions, what are you feeling right now that we have Eric Lander as a cabinet member? Like, I, and that's in, uh, just tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, um, it, all of these are intermingled. And I must say right now, I am feeling especially hopeful and optimistic about the moment um, that, that we have and, 
and that we've been given to reconsider um, the the science and, and engineering enterprise, and especially um, how science intersects with society in a variety of, of different ways. And that's part of the challenge that um, that was given to Eric Lander in this new role. And, and we can we can return to that in a second. Um, but in terms of who I am and, and what I care about, um, I'm actually a, a bioengineer by training. And so I uh, did my training and my PhD at, at MIT, where Eric Lander is from. Um, and before that was a chemist and a chemical engineer um, in, in engineering systems. Um, and for the last uh, decade or so, since finishing my, my PhD, a little bit longer than that, um, I've been really working instead of on engineering of, of organisms and the, the molecular scale engineering, I've been working on en what I call engineering biology at, at social scales. So mm -hmm. what are all those social, political, organizational issues that are coupled to doing science and engineering for, for social good? Um, and trying to use some of the, the types of tools and, and methods that I learned in, in the course of my work, but apply them in understanding you know, what motivates um, scientists and engineers uh, to care about different issues, what enables them to actually work um, between uh, different scientific uh, teams and also all of the different types of, of stakeholders that are really needed to help formulate a, a problem and then work on a solution. Um, so that's, you know, looking at, you know, what, uh, how do we uh, enter into uh, different relationships uh, with each other and also uh, enter in reconfiguring what, what the relationship is between, between science and society. And so uh, what that has looked like over the years is I, um, uh, right out of my PhD, I spent five years um, managing what was called the policy and practices thrust of a multi-university uh, National Science Foundation Center in Synthetic Biology. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was managing- well, Megan, just for a second, what <laughs> is synthetic biology? I yeah. Just, I just, I want to make sure- different, you know definition, going on here. different definitions. And actually, mm -hmm. I think even now um, in, the, in the letter uh, that uh, Biden sent, um, sent Lander, it was, uh, you see synthetic biology show up. And oh, that's really? really interesting. It says from AI to synthetic biology in, 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 the, uh, in the letter. So a lot of the folks that I work with were really excited to see that show up uh, right in this initial, initial charge. And um, you can think of synthetic biology as a field, or you can also think about it as a, as a disposition. <laughs> so hmm. ultimately, right, what we are interested in is how do we leverage the, the power of biotechnology, the power of biology, this, this technology that we're made of that works. Um, can we develop the types of skills and capacities to design in that, in that medium? So you think about it, it's the, the next generation of, of molecular genetic engineering. Um, and it, by showing that we can actually synthesize things rather than just study them, um, that is a way to learn uh, about what living systems do. And in particular, the disposition behind it is this idea that you can uh, learn by doing, learn through synthesis. And, um, and then it also is coupled to it, this idea that we should be doing that synthesis for something, <laughs> for a reason. And so yeah. even in the early days, um, a lot of the things that might be, ha have been recognized as molecular biology or genetic engineering, when uh, called synthetic biology, it was this idea there was embedded principles of, um, of, of doing things for useful purposes. So, you know, um, one of the things I think has happened in this last year, just because of COVID and, 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 and this global pandemic, is we've actually kind of had a, 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 an epidemiology class in some ways, like a global epidemiology class. And, and so we've all, the people paying attention, citizens around the world, have been like, whoa, okay, Moderna had a candidate vaccine in like, February or something like crazy, unheard of uh, edges of possibility. And of course you have to go through FDA and testing and make sure we don't hurt anybody. But this notion of sort of looking at the best R&D lab on the planet, it's got 3 billion years of proof behind it called nature. <laughs> and then saying, how might we learn 
how to manufacture with solar power the way nature does? How might we learn how to create thriving ecosystems where we have mutualism instead of parasitism, you know, that we hear about in the market? How might we learn about these things? And suddenly this ability, and when I was young, uh, or I would say when I was a teen, suddenly this new ability to rip a CD and actually go from this tangible medium called a CD, and before that it was a record, uh, into my computer so that I could have a playlist uh, became this wild thing. You know, it was the, 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 the dawn of the, the new wave. Uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a child of Duran Duran and, and, uh, and, and uh, Front 242 and Public Image Limited and, and English Beat and all those. And, and at the time, it was like this amazing thing that you could rip a physical thing into a digital thing and then you could share it. You know, Napster came up and the rest. Um, but what you're talking about is the ability for us to actually rip the atoms of nature's amazing creativity for manufacturing, for crea you know, creating things, turn them into bits, and then actually think about how we might learn from it and also maybe tweak it a little bit here or there to actually help us with cancer treatments, help us with new ways of dealing with things. Um, say more about that part, this notion that we suddenly can, can move between atoms and bits back to atoms again. Yeah, I, th I think this is one of the reasons it's such an exciting time to be in biology is at just the first example that, that you gave with the Moderna vaccine or vaccine development. A lot of this, I think Andrew Hessel actually highlighted that this in your very first um, episode, right? <laughs> yeah. Digital response uh, to, to a, a pandemic where we uh, all of a sudden aren't uh, limited in our ability to respond by shipping a sample across the world, right? That mm. we can sequence it, upload it, then download it somewhere else, study it, make um, fragments of that that virus in this case, right? To, to work on a, a vaccine or, or countermeasures or therapeutics. And, um, and there's a suite of tools, the, the one that's garnered the most attention um, because it has a great acronym is CRISPR, um, but there's a suite of tools that allow us now to easily read, write, edit, and evolve and use that set of tools to be able to work in partnership with biology where we can take the, the best parts that it's engineered on it by, you know, in its own um, environment and then combine that with things that we know and learn from a wide variety of different living organisms and systems and then put those to use. Um, mm. And it's shifted, it's shifted the paradigm where the, you know, the problem often isn't the science and technology. The problem is how we interface that with all of the other social systems and, and mm. infrastructures and institutions, uh, regulatory and, and policy issues. Um, and broader biosecurity. Yeah. I mean, each each of these new frontiers has the potential to be, you know, what Vannevar Bush looked at for the atomic era. There's no maybe question. Maybe you can give us an appreciation the, of the, the biological the, century in some ways. You know, so uh, an, appre an appreciation. Know, there's something going on here. Go ahead, of, Peter. I'd love to get an appreciation of almost the state change here because uh, uh, we're now going into an era that's not so much extractive, but regenerative. Uh, we've been so worried in the past that we're using up resources and polluting, and synthetic biology suggests less use of energy, uh, relying on both the brilliance of nature, but that's a very different framing of both what to expect from science and what it might imply for the planet. And when we talk about endless frontiers, give us a sense for how distinctive this is from perhaps what we've seen. Yeah, I, I actually think it's an interesting framing in terms of frontiers. It's you know what are the what are the the, the frontiers of making sure that that um, science is serving society. So those interfaces with with science um, and and social institutions is is key. But also we you highlighted the number of great other uh, science and engineering fields that are coming on today. Right? It's it's not just like it's not science alone. It's also not biology alone, we're gonna need frontiers for how we interface with different different disciplines. Um, but also I think uh, the intro today highlighted that, you know, if, if we spent 75 years um, in this uh, posture of uh, conflict um, and science coming out of this premise of conflict with, with others, 
Mm-hmm. And recognizing there's a you know peaceful purposes and peace, mm-hmm. you know, peaceful times. Here now we're developing new new strategies and and identifying new needs in light of um, what is salient in a in a really global challenge, right? Where mm-hmm. all of humanity is fighting a, a, not just a pandemic, but also the effects of climate change and um, and seeing gross inequities in some of the types of solutions we've already developed. And it's really heartening to see embedded in the, the five set of challenges that, um, or five questions that, that President Biden posed to um, to Eric Lander and, and his team, that it represents a, a different type of, of challenge, right? Which mm-hmm. I, I think they were exactly that, like, uh, how do we how do we approach public health? How do we approach climate change? How do we approach equity? Um, how do we uh, how do we approach thinking about the sustainability of our institutions? And all of those questions will re- are you know answering those questions will re- require us to rethink um, rethink science and engineering. It was um, a grand challenge here in their own right. I, there, there's one thing I want to flag, you know. Um, the idea of even addressing inequity, the idea of addressing climate, which you know is is a clarion call, and this invisible enemy that's that's you know we have a lot of viruses that live with us and are part of us. That's 54 kilobits. It's like less than a word document and a blank word document, you know, that could could hobble the planet. This is the this is such a different thing. But one of the things I think is fascinating, and I I just I would love you to talk a little bit about this this aspect that you've looked at for the social scale of biology called iGEM. Yeah. That how do we inspire the next generation? And I suspect there's a second order effect that they will learn about system thinking. They will learn about policy. They will learn about just because we can do something, should we do something? So can you elaborate a little bit on iGEM? And, uh, sure. and I think Omid has a picture or two, but it's amazing what you've been focusing on there. Yeah, so um, one of the other you know interesting aspects of the, the the birth and growth of synthetic biology is it it closely um, follows the development of this uh, science and and engineering competition that um, also came out of of MIT and it started right around when I started my my PhD in bioengineering, and um, it it came out of this uh, idea that once the tools of synthetic biology basically. Uh, the uh, a way to to make uh, pieces of DNA modular so that they could be built like like Lego bricks. Uh, they actually call them bio bricks. <laughs> and then uh, the idea is, well, could you engineer biology like you, we can engineer in other fields? And they said, well, the the founders, which are some of my uh, close friends and colleagues now, the competition said, well, you know, the best way to to test out the ability to engineer living systems in this way is to give the tools uh, uh, to, to young minds that, that don't know the, the limits of the possibilities. And that started what um, is the, now become the International Genetically Engineered or iGEM competition, which is a yearly competition to design and build um, uh, living uh, organisms for, for useful purposes. And I think in 2019, we had something like 6,000 students from 360 teams in 48 countries, I think, participating. Um, and a, a unique part of the competition, which I've helped direct for um, uh, more than a decade now, is that um, in order to uh, get get prizes in the competition or, or to win, it's not purely competitive. You, you both compete against yourself and compete against others. You don't have to just show some which is sort of this notion of co-opetition or, co-opetition. or co- yeah. yeah which like we want everyone to perform at the best exactly so you against yourself and you compete against others i'm sorry keep going i just no, love these so you know, we, you know there's, there's medals and prizes and the medals are just uh, uh achieving some type of uh of uh skill or demonstration and what's interesting is you don't just need to have technical contributions in this case uh producing a new bio brick part for the the expanding kit, but rather you also need to show that you've been thorough and thoughtful in thinking about what problem you're solving and being responsive to your social context. And so um, I've helped lead a committee and and changes actually in the in the reward structure um, hmm. so that uh, now generations and generations of, of these uh, engineers have, have 
it's become part of the culture of like, of course, we're going to think about these things. Of course, we're going to go out and work with our community um, to figure out what problem to solve and to prototype solutions. But um, you actually asked them to maintain a wiki to like actually think through as a team, what are the policy implications? What are the security implications? If, exactly. if this, I love and Megan, that. It's interesting like if we go back to 1945 in yeah. Vannevar Bush's original report, um, the, the American Association for the Advancement of Science had suggested that that Endless Frontier report be more inclusive. Maybe we should consider what citizens think, involve the public more, educate the public more, make this a, a broader thing. But Bush was like, no, we have a lot of work to do. There's a few of us scientists. Science is an inside baseball game. And so, and so it became a bit more of a closed community. And fast forward to today, to the lack of trust in science, to the sense that they're elites. And in a way, what was coded then, the reflection of the world then, is coming back to bite us now. And what's fascinating is you're dealing with a form of science that probably has the biggest set of ethical implications, just because we can program life, and you're doing something very inclusive. So tell us something about how this builds trust and this culture of inclusivity that seems to be part of iGEM. I think part of it is the idea that anybody can participate, right? So these um, these competitions and everything else are meant to to lower the barrier to participation. And the best way to to um, sort of trust in science is you know your neighbor or your or your child or your grandmother, right? <laughs> are are um, have their have their hands in it, um, and also that the folks can choose different roles. And also, I think we're you know, we're really just proving the idea that it, it's it's just an elite. It, science is better when you involve more people. And it, critically, in terms of this frontier of science and society, there are so many problems and so many of them are uh, need to be, you know, have the context around them. And so the idea of global communities solving local problems everywhere in the world um, is, again, a different form of science. And I think that's the opportunity here is to and it's outlined in these uh, the charge to the uh, to Eric Lander and his team. It's like, what are the what are our strategies? What are our actions? We ha we have the opportunity to rethink um, the the way we structure, incentivize, and and think about science. It is so, so cool to be in a week where we're considering frontiers. It's like it's crazy. that that <laughs> you know his becoming president and then also liberating these frontiers is a very cool thing. And we said today that we would bring us, bring multiple frontiers. So, so Megan, I now want to bring on Mandy Birch because if things get changed by synthetic biology, when we switch to quantum computing, most of the rules we thought we knew growing up, they changed. So yeah, Mandy, actually before Megan, don't leave yet. Mandy, what was your reaction to what Megan just was sharing? Well, I, I think there's a couple of things that came to mind. The way that she described harnessing the power of biology to be able to solve problems. I mean, that's a very familiar construct to me in, in terms of thinking about a different discipline in, in physics and really being able to harness the power of physics to do good in the world, to solve useful problems. You know, it's been more than a century that we've understood the fundamental laws of, of quantum physics, but it's just now that we understand them well enough that we can start, you know, moving from science to engineering and do something something useful, harness that power uh, um, towards solving problems. And I think we're we're going to find the, the, the type of disruption that when we understood the fundamental laws of thermodynamics and were able to put them to work, we had the industrial revolution. When we were able to understand electromagnetism and put that to work, we were a we had the digital revolution. And I think we're gonna see something in, in similar in quantum. So Megan, I love the way that you described uh, how that evolution from science to engineering to being able to solve useful problems works because I think it, we see a similar pattern in other disciplines as well. Mandy, do you imagine uh, like an iGEM for quantum, you know, so that students for kids and others and you know, I know I know that your group has been working on literally like Python for quantum so that people can do things now for what might might be a little while out. Do you see that as well or some or even an, a mashup between you know the iGEM uh, synthetic biology space and quantum? What's your take on that? Megan, maybe we should talk. I think what's really important is making that these new, these frontier technologies accessible to a diverse mm -hmm. 
of people, right? And we've seen this happen in quantum really just over the last five years when when we mm. first were able to deploy our systems on the cloud, you know, it was only a very niche of experts that, you know, at the intersection of computer science and physics and uh, that, that could actually do something with the machines. And, and gradually you add layers of abstraction on top where more and more people can do things on it. So now if you're uh, an expert in machine learning and you know how to program in Python, you can start you know, running your your workflows on quantum computers and, and begin to experiment with it. So, Megan, maybe you and I should have a, a conversation to see uh, how your program and where the intersection might be. Yeah, and actually, I think that's one of the key opportunities. Is it you know, it's clear that not one technology skill set is going to be needed. Um, it's one of the limitations of of just a a bio competition is clearly there are other technologies either in partnership or as alternatives that might be better solution sets. Or well, weird um, teammates, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's a, I think the intersection, there's a lot of fruitful possibilities. I mean, I think about that intersection as well, right? Like we've talked about artificial intelligence and one of the first applications we think for quantum computing is gonna be in the area of machine learning. And of course, when Feynman first envisioned a quantum computer back in the eighties, you know, the idea was, well, well, quantum physics, why can't we harness this to simulate things that happen in nature that are inherently quantum, right? So what I think we're going to see across all of the sciences really, that's gonna be also one of the first frontiers where quantum computing is applicable just because you can very naturally simulate what happens in nature on a quantum computer. You know, okay, wait, wait, wait. Who are, who are you, Mandy? Who? We didn't even get there. I think it's important for, uh, and we'll come back to Megan later. And <laughs> thank you, Megan. This will be fun. But who are you, Megan? Just and Mandy, as you as you tell us your story, I'd love you to also explain to us in straight in some terms about quantum computing, because on the outside, when we hear about yeah. it on the radio. Um, it's some set of orders of magnitude faster solving problems that would take billions of years yesterday. And so there is, tell us about that. What There's again? a lot of pop culture hype about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would love to talk about that. I'll give you a quick introduction yeah. introduction to myself. That's a lot less interesting than the quantum computer, but my background is engineering. I'm a mechanical engineer. I started out my uh, career in the US Air Force and doing research and development work. Control systems was my specialty, and I got to work on cutting edge technology 25 years ago and uh, looking at micro swarming vehicles and, and, and things that you know were very much so science fiction at the time. Uh, but looking back, it's neat to think you know I got to be a part of that. But as the career of a military officer goes, I wasn't able to stay in the lab for very long, and, and I moved on to other uh, types of engineering where I was uh, working with infrastructure and installation management. So that was a really fascinating time of my career where I got to learn a lot more about leadership and then eventually evolved to be a little bit more focused on international strategy. Uh, and so now I've transferred to the private sector and really get to use all of those skills at once, the engineering skills, the leadership skills, and then the international skills. So it's an exciting place to be. And I would say that I, I see my mission as being able to set the conditions for people to thrive. And I got to do that in a national security mission context before. And now I get to do it with a frontier technology because I think that, that these powerful technologies need needs to be in the hands of the good guys first and foremost so that we can shape the direction of these technologies, but also just being able to uh, you know, lead teams and, and create environments where people can create, be creative and, and think of new things and move these frontiers forward is you know, um, really, I think, an important part of what I feel like is my, my call in life. Well, um, I think, Mandy, what's amazing about this, though, is that I think, too, and, and we could have a separate episode about this, but I think this notion that we have invested a lot of educational effort, we've invested a lot in in security and in, in national security and interest, and we have an amazing amount of citizens in this country who are who are veterans, who, who you know, actually this was their best pathway to actually get an education. This was their best pathway to actually learn about how to lead. And, you know, one of the things you did was you learned how to lead. And I mean, the Air Force is an incredibly, you know, rarefied world in some ways. And you learned how to lead very smart people moving up very fast and help people find access. And I, I just think this is a wonderful story too about, because we, we can't ignore the human component, even from Vannevar Bush, you know, the human component, him being able to walk in and talk to, to Roosevelt mattered. 
And one of the things it sounds like you're doing is you've made a beautiful transition that I'd love to see a lot more people make from veteran from this world to the startup community. Tell us about where the heck you are now. You're, you're at a place called Rigetti. And it's, it does not sound, if I wrote it out as a startup company on paper, I would not get funding five years ago. I'm surprised that I think I actually would credit it with the founder and with the whole team that, that they've been able to do it now and that, that you now have this ability to say, how do we give this to more people? How do we help people explore the very boundaries of a foundation, of a frontier? So say more now about, I guess, quantum. That would be good for us to understand. And then what is what is the place you're at now? Sure. Um, so I'm at Rigetti Computing, and it was founded in 2013, and we uh, started from the ground up with our company. So we do full stack quantum computing, which means we take the bare silicon, we we work with it in our foundry to create and manufacture the quantum devices. We package those up in the cryogenic systems that operate at temperatures uh, much colder than outer space. We put the compiler, the software on top of them, and then you know we're also working on algorithms and applications because our mission really is to uh, to, to um, solve humanity's most important and pr pressing problems. So getting all the way to that end use is critically important, which kind of bridges to what is quantum technology and where is it where is it now? I think when quantum computing was really initially uh, conceived by Feynman, you know, there was kind of a limited set of things that people thought a quantum computer might be able to do. It, you know, those who were who were visionaries thought there were a limited set of things they could do, and then we had Shor's algorithm, which um, can 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 crack encryption, come along in the '90s, and Grover's algorithm, uh, you know, is a theoretical. Uh, algorithm at the theoretical level that can do search more effectively and efficiently. And so for many years, people have been working on building quantum computers with these very, you know, lofty, theoretically perfect computers in mind. So I think a lot of people think you know, what quantum, what first comes to mind as an application for quantum computing is cracking encryption. But really, that's probably one of the longer term uh, applications of, of quantum mm. computing. That is the fault tolerant quantum computing. And if you remember, you know, early mainframe kind of computers, they weren't fault tolerant to begin with. So it took many years to evolve. But in the interim, um, what, what's happened is, is there's been a lot of advances in the algorithms and the thinking around what quantum computers can do. So we're what is called the noisy intermediate scale quantum era right now where there's um, you know a, a specific set of problems that quantum computers uh, will likely help solve. Now, it, when you think about quantum computers, they're not likely to uh, replace your laptop, for instance. You can think of these as accelerators, at least in this near-term era, to high performance computing capabilities where you have certain workflows that have a certain aspect of that problem that's quantum accelerable uh, and, and, and can be worked in. So like if you take uh, what are some of the most promising applications for that, it, they're around uh, quantum machine learning, uh, they're around uh, quantum simulation of inherently uh, qu uh, inherently phenomena that are inherently quantum mechanical. Uh, they're around uh, some optimization problems and some ways that we can simplify those right now for the scale and noise of computers that we have. Uh, maybe eventually Monte Carlo simulations, uh, more general differential um, equations, and eventually some of those. So Mandy, let's, let's take, because I probably um, can follow about 5% of that, because I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm kind of just a, a big kid. But um, you know, one of the things that I think you were sharing with me when we got a chance to tour your lab up in Berkeley was, was this notion that, um, that the traveling salesman, which is like this classic idea of a salesman has to travel between you know city to city and they have to like optimize for like they've got only so much fuel and they've got only so much money to spend on the hotel and things like that. When you're doing that between a few cities, it's not so bad. I mean, we could use a normal computer to do that. Can you can you tell us about that just as an example to help our audience kind of understand what the difference is between classical bits and bytes, ones and zeros, which we've right. all kind of heard, and more you know, Moore's law thing, and quantum? Why is this such a different thing? 
Yeah, so um, there's three basic principles that are leveraged from physics um, that, that help make quantum computers useful, but differentiate it from a bit, which is zero and one. And so the, the first one is superposition. So instead of being zero or one, uh, a quantum bit can be both at the same time. So that's superposition. You have entanglement where the state of, of two particles, uh, they, they, they are inherently intertwined. So no matter how far apart those those particles are, uh, and, and by the way, I'm an engineer, so the physics, the physicists will critique me on this, but a simplified version of it, that those those two particles uh, are connected in, in space and, and depend upon one, one another to understand. And then uh, interference, constructive and destructive interference of waves. And, and quantum computers are not deterministic. They, they, they don't solve problems like two plus two equals four. They solve problems that are inherently um, based on probability and statistics. And so um, you brought up the problem of uh, traveling salesperson problems. So for instance, that from a theoretical complexity perspective, that is a, an intractable problem on classical computers. You, you actually can't solve that. What you can is you, you can do a, an optimized version of that problem, but from a theoretical complexity perspective, um, you know, it grows, that problem grows exponentially very quickly. And there's no way that, you know, that you can, um, can solve that. So it's problem. like if, if you're saying the traveling salesman goes between, you know, six cities or five cities, you can come up with an optimization and you can figure out how to run your FedEx trucks or, you know, be optimized for fuel and things like that. But when you just add a few more cities, it would take like the heat death of the universe to compute, you know, the best pathway for them to do. And so that that exponential growth is very quick because it looks the same until suddenly it's insane. That's and an interesting way. The way you just frame very, this, yeah. Mick, is, is a thermodynamic problem, which is that in conventional computing, the amount of energy you'd need to do something, you, it just stalls out. So it sounds like one of the fundamental differences here is not just speed, but energy. And therefore, a, 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 that's what happens when you apply different physics to computing. That's right. And that's why it's eventually going to be more scalable and more economic and more energy efficient because you can add, you know, theoretically infinite number of qubits uh, and that's not going, you're not going to lose the same kind of energy that you have with a transistor that heats things up. You're not going to have to have these uh, gymnasium sized, you know, cooling plants or, or, or uh, nuclear sized power plants to run the next you know, generation of high performance computing. So uh, of course the cryogenics, uh, which are an essential part, part of quantum computers right now, uh, at least for right now, um, you know, those are energy intensive, but you can continue to add qubits within that system without increasing the energy from each one. So when we saw that picture of the, of the Rigetti quantum computer, I don't know if Omid, if you can pull that back up, um, just so humans that don't pay attention to this every day can understand that, picture. Uh, Omid, can you pull up that the picture from Rigetti that looked like kind of a weird upside down? There you go, right there. So the idea is at the top, it's the it's as cold as outer space. And then another level down, it's colder. Another level down, it's colder. Another level down, it's literally negative 270 something degrees below zero. And there's a there's a chip down there. And somehow you've got to kind of try to put these things in this weird entangled space ask it a question, get an answer, and then come back up to classical computing and translate it into like an API that a normal computer could fit. And I think you recently announced that you now are offering quantum Python through Amazon or something. Like, like so people that are experimenters, this is kind of insane to me, can actually get a cloud account. And it's not, you know, capable of everything yet, but you can explore. Like, t am I getting that right, or am I completely? That's right. I mean, our quantum computers have been on the cloud for several years now, and, and last year we were able to launch with um, AWS and their bracket service. So yeah, it's becoming more and more accessible. And you're right, uh, quantum computers right now are not solving any problems better, faster, or cheaper. But we're on the threshold of having the size and scale of computer with you know enough controls around the noise to be able to actually uh, get there you know google had uh, reached quantum supremacy quantum supremacy is defined as you know being able to to solve something better faster or cheaper um, but it's for, it's it's not a useful problem necessarily so our focus right now is trying to get to quantum advantage 
where you can solve something better, faster, or cheaper. And I think what we'll see is these inflection points where, you know, the quantum computer will probably solve something better, faster, or cheaper, but then what will happen is classical computer will surpass it. So we'll see leapfrog for a while until we can get to that scale and, and with the theoretically theoretical complexity arguments so that we'll know that we'll have a durable quantum advantage. So we'll see that evolution over the coming years. Mandy, can I ask a commercial question? When Eckert and Walkley created uh, ENIAC and later UNIVAC, they wrote a memo in which they're trying to imagine the census department buy, might buy one, the military, they, they figure like five people could need one. Um, yeah, there might be a, a worldwide market for five people. I remember the and, chairman of IBM it, asked. It was both that. funny, but they were trying to imagine, you know, they were very literally trying to figure out who are the people that crunch a lot of numbers. After the, the war. Census, the military, and then some accountants. My question to you is, you're a venture-backed startup. Who do you imagine the customers to be? And and like, you know, are these bought by enterprises? Are they bought by cloud things? Is it military? Does this go the way Cray went early on? Yes, all of the above. So I think, um, you know, I, I think the first customers will be those who are already using high performance computing of some sort, whether that's the massive scientific uh, enterprise through the national labs, um, like Oak Ridge National Lab, or um, uh, through uh, Amazon, uh, Microsoft Azure, these cloud services, I think, you know, those, those will be um, some of the first uh, opportunities to actually leverage quantum computing. But, you know, we're also, also seeing within the financial industry, for instance, um, the ability, uh, you know, applications in, in machine learning, Monte Carlo simulation that I think will be at the forefront. Um, I think the pharma industry, they'll, they'll, um, they're a little bit more risk averse for, for obvious reasons. So they'll probably be a little bit later adopters, but I think that they'll be uh, quickly behind. So I think the scientific enterprise, financial sector and pharma will be the top three early Early on uh, in defense as well, and they have a lot of problems that are, are, are general problems, you know, in machine learning and those types of things. I was going to say, say we, do we want to get everyone else in here? Yeah, let's bring everybody a, else in, and I have a transition for that. Um, Mandy, yeah. we began today's conversation, of course, talking about Bush's endless frontier, and as Zach pointed out to us, the frontier has been an ongoing theme in America. Yeah. In 1977. Uh, Louis Branscombe, who is the chief scientist for IBM, wrote this. Omid, can we bring this thing up? This is, he wrote, information, the ultimate frontier. And this was his thinking that, oh, we're going to go into a world where computers will be miniaturized, ubiquitous, inclusive, and maybe we'll be able to realize Vannevar Bush's other great dream, the Memex, the, what, what basically became the World Wide Web. And and Zach, I'd love your thoughts on this. Kind of weaving through all of this is almost this singular or atomic or most basic measure of information. It's what unites biology, information technology, uh, and we seem to have been going, you know, from the most small parts of physics to the most small units of information. But it's a theme that keeps coming back. You're right. Managing information, the exponential growth of information the rise of search, the rise of information appliances. These are anticipated by Bush in the 40s and then elaborated on in the 60s by Doug Engelbart and in the 70s by Ted Nelson, often neglected for his in innovation of hyperlink. Um, and I think that when you hear someone like Sergey Brin say, Google is the mind of God, what does he mean by that? Because he's not a religious person. He's not communing with God the way I might say on a regular basis. He's just thinking if reality is completely consisting of information and if the web contains all the information and if we think of God under some Judeo-Christian conceptions as the mind that encompasses all rational thought, well, then the web is the mind of God. Then the web is all of it. Um, I think that the tension in Bush's thinking was twofold. Could the management of information, these new technologies, become a mass tool? Or would this just be for elites? When he can now, I want to you know, stop for a second. So, Zach, um, you mentioned... Memex, you mentioned the mother of all demos, effectively, uh, uh, Doug Eaglebart. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of people may not even know what that is. So we definitely should should flag that if you get a chance, 
uh, you should look up the mother of all demos, which was Doug Engelbart, <laughs> which was sort of well, Doug Engelbart talked about augmentation. So the essential yeah. tension is between does information empower humans in their quests, or are humans subject to information and information flows somehow act independently of humans? Um, so I want to, I want to, real quick, just say we're a little after the hour. So we've been running for about an hour. I think this could have gone for a much longer time, uh, but it is. We're now going to enter overtime, which I was hoping we get to 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 a conversation like this a little sooner. But <laughs> we just, it's it's a Friday night. I don't know. I can't really. Let me just, let me just finish. Um, my, my, if anyone me. needs to leave, I want to just make sure that you have a chance to to bail on a Friday night, Mandy or Megan or. Or Zach, um, but if you can hang a little longer, I just would love this conversation. What is as we may think? Well, so as we may think was the essay that Bush wrote, published in the summer of 1945. In fact, in the single month of July, Bush releases the Endless Frontier report, witnesses the first atomic test in Trinity in New Mexico and publishes in the Atlantic Monthly this um, Memex essay. And again, Bush thought of computation as helping intellectuals and scholars. And so the tension is, we see it today in the internet. Is the internet just a dark pile of garbage? Is it just the worst thing that's ever happened to human society and out of control? Or is it an enormously enriching tool for people with a purpose and a high-minded sense of what knowledge and research is. So and in that tension, by the way, I want to get back to two yeah. things that were brought up. Yeah. Um, mm. One is how science can serve society when scientists insist on governing themselves. Dr. Lander, in simple mm. terms, put crudely, is part of a group of molecular biologists and uh, biomedical people that think that they are entitled to run themselves, to govern their own activities. Hmm. They are not governing their activities through legislation, through plebiscites of the masses, and that unites the scientific elite of today with hmm. the scientific elite of Vannevar Bush's time. Wait, before you go much further, actually, I want, Megan, you look like you might have a reaction to that. Yes. Um, and this is dinner. I mean, we can just have reactions. And um, please, let's turn to the scientific elite we have on the line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's, I've, uh, I've struggled with this notion of, of self-governance for a long time. And actually, mm. um, uh, a few years ago, brought a bunch of um, not just scientists and engineers, but others back to um, a, a Silomar, which was the site um, in, wow. the, in 1975, where um, at, th at that time, the you know, founding mothers and fathers of, of genetic engineering assembled to think through how they would govern themselves. Um, but I, I think often it's a little bit of a, a myth. There's always been these, you know, these institutions that are surrounding them and even shaping those, those narratives. <laughs> um, even then it was, um, uh, you know, the, 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 there was pr pressures and other things going on around how uh, we should think about the uses of, of biotechnology and in that case, deciding that we don't want to use, we don't want to use biology to make weapons, right? So there were other large shifts that were governing behaviors um, that, that weren't only coming from, from within the community, although I'm sure we'll have a good debate over where, where different individuals influence those decisions um, through, <laughs> through time. Um, but even now, I think I think we are seeing um, in part a, a next generation that recognizes that they have, um, you know, it, it is necessary, but but not sufficient, right? They they can make some decisions of, you know, they have a role to play because they're closest to the technology and might be able to talk about, you know, what its power and possibilities are, but ultimately knowing that they have blinders as a result of this narrow focus. Um, so I, I'm hopeful that the next generation doesn't. Think they should have only that, 
you know, that responsibility alone, but it's really shared. Well, and you've been in the trenches with the next generation of, of both high school students and undergrads. And I think one of the students is part of one of these unicorns now uh, that the other, you know, the other, one of the other founders didn't even change majors from, or change disciplines from computer science to biology. So it was like over his 50, if I remember correctly. So well, there's an interesting kind of cross-generational, interesting story here too that you get to watch. Yeah, and well, it's the, yeah. the discussion here, um, you know, at the very beginning, um, in terms of different disciplines inheriting different lessons, right? Uh, we mm. had a conversation about, you know, physicists, right? There's big evidence of certain lessons that accompany, right, about the the use of of their knowledge um, that are mm. hard to evade. Um, but there's a, a for instance, a whole generation of, of biological scientists and engineers that, that don't necessarily have this history in mind that that we mm. did at one point have biological weapons. Um, so that's why it's actually so important to learn from you know the the different um, phases and interpretations and the the drivers for science um, not always being right so pure <laughs> um, yeah. and having a reality about that while still. Uh, wanting more, right? Wanting, as we, you know, say in this letter that that drove sort of our conversation today, right? How do we create healthier, safer, more just, peaceful, and prosperous worlds, right? Mm -hmm. And making sure we still have our our north star. My only point was that self governance is not an issue. It's a fine principle, and these technical and highly specialized fields, often the only people that can really understand the issues are in them. Mm. So I'm not against self-governance. I'm for it. Um, mm. I think it's fine. And, and it's generally served science well. But it does create this tension between service to society and the integrity of your own field. And then well, we also have the problem of unintended consequences. It's interesting to point out this, of, this of very weak in human history is a crucible of self-governance and, and the public. If you look at information technology, algorithms, Facebook, <laughs> you, you and I were both in Silicon Valley 20 years ago. Uh, as I said to you yesterday, Steve Jobs wanted to change the world, and the world didn't really care. And so we went along, and we developed stuff, and we built the, the machines that we built, the algorithms we built, and our business models. And then all of a sudden, in kind of rapid order, we realized its impact on jobs, its impact on cognition, uh, how it changes discourse, the impact of robots on how we think. And suddenly, that conversation has moved from a few people self-governing clearly into the halls of Congress. And if there's any question about it, they felt like they got attacked. Mandy, I think but you may have- Section 230 still exists. And Section 230 means Twitter gets to govern itself, Google gets to govern itself, well, uh, we'll see what happens. I think, I think yeah. parallels between the biomedical field and the information technology field are very strong. I think. I see Mandy said. I got to get to here, Mandy. Covering themselves. Good government absolutely requires cognitive diversity. I don't care how smart smart you are. Yeah. You you have a set a view of the world, and particularly a community starts to have a view of the world. And with the complexity and the implications mm -hmm. of technology today, there's no way to do that well by yourself. Now, I don't disagree that there's a really important need for professional discipline, but I, I, it's necessary, but it's insufficient in this world. And, and you know, I mean, frankly, mm -hmm. I think it goes to you know uh, again, this administration for adding a scientist to the cabinet, right? Like this is important for cognitive diversity. It's mm -hmm. not just about solving the problems we have, uh, you know, that particularly require science right now, but it's about a way of thinking, you know, that discipline of having a hypothesis mm -hmm. and testing, you know, we, we definitely need that in, in all areas of governance right now. So I think that that good governance ha requires that. You know, in high performance teams and they're, they're I, because I have, you know, I'm a senior advisor at BCG, we published a number of, um, of studies about if you increase cognitive diversity, you outperform the market over and over again, up to 15 or 20% in the public markets by having cognitive diversity. First thing you can do is women and men. We tried to do that here. We're not always that successful because it takes, it takes us work. But the second part is just this notion of inviting people for filling a blind spot, not for fit. 
right? Mm -hmm. Fit often is like, they think like me, I want to hire them. Yeah, I, I like going out. Actually, it's not about going out for a drink. It's about, I've got a blind spot because this is the way I think. And seeing what? the eyes and, and the mind and the eyes of others is one of the and most interdisciplinarity powerful Interdisciplinarity now is so important because of that. Yeah. Interdisciplinarity. Yeah. I wrote a book called The Diversity Advantage, and one of the key challenges for science has been rigid disciplines that yeah. need to stretch. And as Mandy pointed out well, that mm -hmm. diversity is often what's been infused by computation into biology or molecular biology and vice versa. And so interdisciplinarity is possibly the second major force that people have to grapple with along with this, how does science serve society? So I have a question from Megan. Uh, this was a gift, this, uh, this, this. Um, yeah, Amino Labs, yeah. Amino Labs, and it's actually, apparently it's like a high school thing where the minute you get it, you have to like refrigerate certain things at different temperatures, but it's got, and the extension one has a centrifuge but it's got a whole like amazing book about, about you know, make your own cultures. Learn yeah. how to actually turn bacteria on so it turns on in different colors under, under LED light. It's this thing about, and, and so I actually bought one for my, my sister who teaches math and science in the Chicago public schools and yeah. helps teachers learn how to fall in love with math and science. And she freaked out, she brought her her grandchildren in and they started tinkering. Um, tell me more about this, like this notion that there literally are like kits to do synthetic biology. I yeah. think that's a way that we get past this, you know, this vertical disciplinary thing. Parents have to help the kids figure this out, I think sometimes. Well, one of the, um, I have had some um, amazing colleagues over the year who here's who have developed some of these materials. And another one uh, you might look into is, is BioBuilder, which is actually a, a club that's aimed at um, primarily even a, a middle school and, and sometimes younger, you know, goes younger and younger. Um, and uh, it is the idea of, of not only just do it your, yourself, but do it together. And what's what, it called? BioBuilder? BioBuilder, yeah, BioBuilder.org. Um, Natalie Kuldell is an amazing uh, woman who's helped to, to develop this, um, and she was a colleague at, at MIT at that time. And um, what's interesting is that uh, it, this is curricula to, to teach engineering um, with, at, at earlier stages. And, and this is the first time they're not just pioneering bio, bioengineering education, but engineering education. And this idea mm -hmm. of embedding in um, questions of ethics, it, even at oh, that wow. earlier stages. So you're introducing um, concepts of, of science and engineering in this new paradigm, and also mm -hmm. the idea that it's inextricably linked from you know what are the problems we decide to work on, and that that it necessitates the, this technology because it it is made of us because it is our entire world we can't escape it that we need everyone right we need everyone and that we all have a responsibility because it's we're learning about ourselves right and that's in addition to this sort of utility drawn um, inquiry there's also a, a, a really foundational sort of awe that I think is true in other in other fields as well, but the idea of of learning about our own biology, right? Learning about ourselves um, yeah. and, and needing to have that reflection embedded in. And so it's so, so cool to see these kits. And my, my biggest wish is that as we develop kits to do it, do it ourselves, that we really do do it together, right? Do it with your family, do it with your neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, I mean, and it's the maker that. movement that, that Peter's written about with Dale Doherty from his book, The Maker City Playbook, and, and the rise of, you know, 180,000 parents and kids showing up in Santa Clara at a maker fair, you know, and it's the greatest show and make on earth. Um, <laughs> we have one last guest that I'd really love to get in because actually he touches on things we haven't talked about robotics and AI. And I'd love if you can stay, uh, if you can stay, I'd love you to listen to his assertions because he actually talks about this boundary between what it's like to be a scientist and what it's like to be a citizen and what it's like to actually go down a blind alley and how science actually has to question its own self. Uh, so if you can stay and if anyone has to leave, um, it's Friday night, uh, it might be time 
to refill. I apparently have run out of wine. Maybe it's time for champagne this week. Um, go for a refill, but stay on if you can, because I'd like your reactions, all three of you, to Gary. Uh, he has totally blown my brain away in the last like five or 10 years with ways of thinking. And uh, so Peter uh, and Omid, let's run Gary's clip uh, and then we'll come on back. Gary, tell us who you are. Let's get a little bit of an introduction first. Hi, I'm Gary Marcus. I am a cognitive scientist who runs AI companies. My training was originally in trying to understand how children learn language. And I'm currently running a robotics company called Robust AI, which started about a year and a half ago with me and Rodney Brooks and some other people. I was kind of an AI geek even before I studied cognitive science when I was a little kid. I got hooked on computers when I was eight years old. My first computer was a paper computer. I, I learned to program on a paper computer that's basically a simulation of a computer where there were <laughs> registers and you would write the values for those registers and then look them up and copy oh, them wow. to other okay. places and stuff like that. I went to college early, partly on the basis of a Latin translator that I had written in Logo, which is more or less yeah. uh, like this. And so I had an initial period of excitement about AI. The Latin translator that I wrote did pretty well on Latin one, like the first semester of Latin, but it didn't really work. It, it taught me enough to understand what the problems and the challenges were, but I thought, man, we have a long way to go here. And another thing I was interested in then actually was a, a natural language front end to a database. And we still don't have very good versions of that 30 some years later. So I started there <coughs> interested in how to make machines do smart things. A few of the things I wanted them to do have been done since in, in the decades mm -hmm. since. So I was also interested in like how to build a better chess computer. And that's pretty much a solved problem now. But a lot of the language problems still aren't solved. So I went off, I studied how children learn language. I came very, became very impressed with human beings and how good they were at understanding language and just basically stopped paying attention to AI for a while. And then I spent most of my time as a scientist. And as a scientist, one of the things that I look for really carefully is when I'm wrong, which I don't think happens that often, all modesty aside, but it happens occasionally. And when it does, that wakes me up. And what woke me up was Watson winning in Jeopardy. I thought, hmm. there's no way that anybody knows how to build an AI good enough to do human language. And this is surprising. So I dug into it and I was disappointed by how it won. It turns out there's a little bit of a cheat in there, not intentionally, but, but it still got me back into AI. So the, the cheat was 95% of the answers, quote answers in, in Jeopardy are titles of Wikipedia pages. So you don't really have to understand language <laughs> in general and do yeah. inference in an open-ended way on arbitrary things because it's almost always a Wikipedia page. And so it becomes an information retrieval exercise rather than a real language exercise, mm. which is often how these things turn out. But it got me back into AI. And around the same time, I got a gig writing for The New Yorker and actually started writing about Watson for The New Yorker and then Google Knowledge Graph and stuff like that. And then I spent a couple of years writing about a bunch of different topics for the New Yorker, neuroscience, AI, psychology, all, all for the online blog that was called Elements. And then I saw DeepMind sell for $600 million or something like that. Yeah. And it was a different kind of business than I had known was even possible, which was basically smart people with smart ideas, but not necessarily a product per se. And I thought, I've never thought about business, but I could probably do that. I know smart people and I have some good <laughs> ideas. And, and instead of giving them away for free for the New Yorker, maybe I'll start a company. And so I did. And that company was called Geometric Intelligence. And I brought in Zubin Garamani, who was one of the best machine learning people in the world and happens to share my birthday and went to graduate school with me. So okay. worked on the company for two years. We sold it to Uber. From my understanding, Uber did something interesting with the IP that I'm not allowed to tell you about. And that was swell. And then I had a little time to think about what to do next and decided to go after robotics. And the reason that I decided to go after robotics mm. is because <clears throat> I don't find most of AI to be very satisfying. There's often a kind of hidden trick and the solutions are often very narrow. So what we found with Watson is it worked for Jeopardy, but they couldn't really make it into a good medical tool. Like they, they aspired yeah, to turn it into a doctor, a but the doctor has to make and, inferences yeah. and... You, you know how this goes. And then there are great systems now for playing Go, but so what? I mean, it's it's surprising that it happened this year and not, or you know, last year or whatever, and, and not 10 years from now, but it's still not really what I think of as intelligence. So I would argue 
that humans have the most sophisticated rough draft brain of any creature on the planet. And that allows us to learn more than any other creature on the planet. And we learn a phenomenal amount because we have brains that can absorb all kinds of different information. The very first time I saw you speak was quite interesting. You related a story about your kid at a restaurant and how, how no AI in the world effectively was going to be able to do what your kid did. And it was, it, to me, it just woke me up. My kid at the restaurant, I have two kids. And it was um, about but, like but I have getting out of the chair like that. and climbing through oh, the, the chair. Oh, climbing, yeah. yeah, that was, that was at a Whole Foods. Yeah. So what happened there is really interesting. And it relates to something people talk a lot about in the field. So what my daughter did is we were sitting at a Whole Foods and she decided that it'd be fun to climb through the space between the bottom of the chair and the back of the chair. And she decided she wanted to climb through the chair. And she was small enough then that this was a possible thing. And it was really interesting because she was not copying me. Obviously, I'm not going to fit through the chair. And even her older brother wasn't going to fit through the chair. She was <coughs> setting a goal for herself. And we don't really know how to do that. We don't really have robots going around saying, I wonder if I can do that. She didn't say it aloud, but it's obviously in her head. And it's the same thing like when a child will walk on a narrow ledge or... Also, my son is, you know, playing with Arduinos now, and he's wonder if I can, you know, get the yeah. you know, electronics kit to do that. So kids are constantly doing this. So that's part of it that is in itself, I think, is revelatory relative to what we see in AI right now. And then the other thing is the way that she solved the problem is very different. So what's the currency right now is what we call supervised learning. So you get a bunch of examples, you get the right answer to those examples, and you train on them. And you might have millions or billions of examples. And then there's also something called self-supervised learning. We'd go into it if you want. But there's no, no system really that is, I have two examples, right? The self-supervised learning have a is whole still bunch like of a examples. billion yeah. examples, right? Training data, yeah. She had no training data but she figured it out. And it's that figuring it out part that I think is just so cool and so different from AI. And you relate, you relate that to this idea of having a mental model or having a common sense reasoning over, exactly. over the world that she's interacting with. She exactly. has a so model of that. She built herself in a matter of seconds, a model of the chair, this specific chair, like what is the gap between here and there? She actually had to correct herself. And in those pictures, you can see she tries to get through and she gets stuck. So it's not like she's all-knowing, omniscient, but she got stuck and then she reasoned about it. And she's like, what if I wiggle this way or that way and I'll get, and she got up. <laughs> I'll put and my arm through, I'll try a leg. level yeah. of reasoning about her body and how to twist it and what could fit where. It's common sense reasoning about the world. And it's part of what we, we're trying to get our robots to be able to do is to reason about the world in circumstances they haven't seen before. So Gary, when we started the call, just before we spoke, you, you talk, I, we were talking about this show, which is looking at, Endless Frontier, and you pointed out that you're a skeptic. And it sounds like part of this is that there's a bunch of problems that are either easy or where the market pulls people. So you have a whole lot of effort on a small set of problems. And what your curiosity and fascination and the kind of the open terrain is things that we look at least or look at less that may be tougher problems, but are but there's this potential difference because they're self-evident in humans and what's going on there. And is that a generalizable thing as you start approaching a new robotics company? Does that kind of create what you're it's looking It's a at? lot of it. A different way to put it is <clears throat> AI tends to go after the low-hanging fruit. The thing I can do with the technique that I've already got, it's a little bit different from what I did before, but not very different. And to use a term that's actually popular in AI, that leads to getting to a local minimum. You're climbing down a mountain and you go down a little bit, but you don't get to the bottom because you're following some strategy of always going a foot here or there. I mean, you don't have the courage to make, to maybe go back up before you go back down. And you could build a human body much better than it is. And I have a whole book about that called Kluge. But as engineers, we shouldn't be doing that. As engineers, we should be saying, what's the best solution? And are we anywhere near the bottom with what we've got? And it, I spent a lot of the last nine years eight or nine years trying to persuade people that the solution that they were using was not this thing called deep learning, wasn't going to solve causal reasoning, common sense reasoning, language, and so forth. And people jumped up and down on me and said I was a jerk and a loser. And what did I know? So the interesting thing is people stop beating up on me. And in the last year, there's actually been a sea change in the field. So yeah. I've been saying we need more innate knowledge that we need symbolic representations as well as neural network representations. 
And so like just looking at DeepMind alone in the last couple of months, they have a paper that's directly competing with a neurosymbolic approach, but taking those issues seriously. And then they have two papers that actually have a lot of innateness. One was very directly inspired by some of the things that I've said, or says the author, where there's actually building in some notions of space and time and kind of Kantian notions that I, I've been advocating for. And then the, the other one that's pretty cool is folding proteins. And it builds in some innate representations about the nature of proteins, how they're going to be represented in the system mm. and so forth. So DeepMind spent a long time really lobbying against innateness and trying to say one paper called Mastering Human mastering go without human knowledge at the time they, it was actually a bunch of human knowledge we go into that but they have backed off from that it hasn't really worked it hasn't got them where they want if we step back though is this is this science is this just the way it works that there will be an orthodoxy and it'll get science around often, the edges a little and science often not always but periodically gets stuck in corners and i think the value of people like me is to say, hey, you're stuck and you should think about some other mm-hmm. things and these, this might be profitable. What's your reaction to the new administration, Joe Biden, explicitly name checking Vannevar Bush about endless frontier and science and now elevating as someone that's a scientist to the cabinet? That's awesome. <laughs> what else? Could I say? Lander like, is great. I think- yeah, I, I was very pleased both to see that Lander was appointed and to see that he's in the cabinet. This is it's crazy. a sea change yeah. from the asinine things that have been happening in the last few years. It's a wonderful thing to, to have science raise that level. And science is not always perfect, as I was just pointing out, but it's, it's usually better than the alternative. And usually in the long run, it works. And COVID is so much worse than it could have been because people didn't pay enough attention to the things that we did know as scientists, in part because people, lay people aren't trained to think about science. And for example, a good scientist understands the precautionary principle. And in fact, understands the difference between things that we know, things that we don't yet know, but can make guesses about it and so forth. And the classic example of this is every good scientist knows that evolution is quote, a theory rather than a proven fact, because that is the nature of science. But they also know it's a damn good theory that explains an awful lot, that there is no better theory. And you should take it seriously as if it were fact, because there's no strong reason to believe otherwise. And then people who are not scientists say, oh, then I guess I can just believe in creationism. And no, that is not how it works at all, right? You're optimizing Mm -hmm. the best theory relative to the data, and it's clear that evolution is the best theory. I might just throw a question in. COVID has been a fascinating example of the scientific method rubbing up against our population that normally doesn't have to spend that much time on it. The fact that people kept learning things and a theory would come out and be thrown out and was it aerosolized or not, gave lots of people uh, the excuse to say, this stuff's garbage or I can believe in in something else. Exactly, that's what I'm saying is is that non-scientists think that if something isn't completely proven that you shouldn't believe it, whereas scientists think, if I have a lot of evidence for it, it's my best hypothesis and I'll see what else fits with it. Which is a very different way of reading the evidence. Like it happens with climate change too. And 2020 was a huge lesson in why you have to take partial information seriously and you can't just dismiss it. I think that scientists have a moral responsibility to explain what they're doing to the public. We're not just doing this out of love, we're hopefully trying to do this out of love with the ideas. We're hopefully trying to make the world a better place. In American history, there were a couple of instances where science took hold and, and reframed us. Certainly one was the work during the war in Vannevar Bush, but in the after Sputnik, there was a sense of we ought to have our population more scientifically aware, scientific careers, math thinking. If we're at a moment now when systems thinking is really important, consequences are important, if, if you were king or had a grant or were brought in by the president to change our culture, to get more people to think this way, what are the kinds of things we might consider? Big ideas or such that would make ours a more science-oriented culture at a time when it's reckoning with that isn't so solid. I could almost give up on a lot of our curriculum if we could focus on numeracy and critical thinking skills. Mm. So numeracy can mean things like understanding the difference between one in a hundred and one in a million and that mm. something that's one in a hundred might actually kill you and you're not actually safe mm. one in a million you're probably all right 
and critical thinking in general. How good is this data? What is the argument for? How generalizable is it? Should I believe this one study? Should I believe this one person that's told me this? What are the mm. data and why should I believe this? And this is particularly true in the misinformation era, where I think people believe things based on who told them rather than how social yeah. proof weighs heavily. And it is, it's killed people. It frankly has killed a lot of people during COVID. We just, we love that you joined us. Your organization, Robust AI, because you think yeah. a lot of it's pretty brittle right now, it sounds like. The website is, if you link it or whatever, is robust.ai, conveniently. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, thanks Thank very you. much. It was fun. Thanks Take so care. Much. So great talking to you. Take care. Likewise. So, you know, the precautionary principle going, you know, it turns out that sometimes science has to wander down blind alleys. Uh, Gary in the extended interview talked about Mendel, who when he was doing his Peapod experiments, uh, the publisher of the journal that year, uh, where he discovered what ultimately we learned was, you know, genes um, were called factors. And the editor of the journal that year said nothing happened this year. And, uh, you know, to the journal that published Mendel. And then when they actually got to, uh, you know, 30 or 40 years later, Darwin, who had this whole idea of, th of theory of evolution, had the journal in his documents, but had not even made it to that chapter because the editor said there's nothing happening. So we ended up losing like a generation uh, because we went down a blind alley. We actually thought it was going to be a protein. Uh, be, and that was the idea of factors before we figured out this thing called DNA. So uh, anyway, what's your reaction to what Gary just talked about with, with just, uh, you know, he, he's had a very different kind of journey as a journalist, as a storyteller, but also two years te teams up with somebody and sells a company at Uber for close to a billion. Um, and, you know, and, and, and suddenly realizes like, Oh, you know, but it's also kind of a, uh, a fool's errand yet because we don't appreciate how beautiful humans are. Uh, Megan or Mandy, what's what's sort of your reaction to some of the things he said? A, a couple things. I think we see in these you know nonlinear paths of individuals that they take mm. through different types of endeavors where they apply their you know scientific thinking and training and also training in other fields that we we mm. also see that same course for a lot of the um, you know discoveries and inventions. Right? It's often not near. They they pop up in many places in different forms and sometimes it's it's stitching them together and so i think you know this is a moment too where we also can um a, a lot of the things i'm interested in are sort of the science of science and innovation can we can we study um now that we have you know some evidence of the way science and engineering operates um to to learn how uh you know are maybe the stories we tell about how things operate maybe they they aren't necessarily true um and uh, it, just along those lines, one of the things that struck me from <laughs> Gary's comments as well, he said at some point, um, so that we, you know, we don't just do this because we love it. Um, but it reminded me of, um, again, returning to the theme of, of the conversation today, uh, when, uh, when introducing the, the science team and Francis Arnold in particular on, on uh, one of the co-chairs of the Presidential uh, Committee on, on Science and Technology. Um, she, but she'll be a part of the new administration. Yeah, there's there's co-chairs of of um of advisors um that that are appointed every new administration who help advise. So and what's uh, Frances' uh, ba her background? She's an evol evolutionary biologist. Um, and oh wow, okay. So yeah. there's a lot of bio representation on this. Um, but she gave a yeah. really beautiful set of remarks in uh in saying that, uh, you know, at, thinking about her relationship as a as a um, as a scientist. Um, and as an engineer, um, but also as a as a grandmother um, and as a and as a citizen, and saying that you know we are, I think the quote was, we are making a society worth passing on to our children and grandchildren. It is an act of love, and so while it may not be doing it just because we are, <laughs> we love it, yeah, uh, but rather it's something that we are, uh, we 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 realize this way of thinking helps us consider. Um, how you know our what we can do to pass on you know this mm. this planet to our to our children. You remind me of a book because um, I, I always like to name check books. So I have a question for both of you about books you'd love to read. But um, Bina Venkataraman mm -hmm. wrote the Optimist Telescope. She was in the Obama administration, and she, it's a it's a kind of a glorious story of becoming good ancestors. 
and and she tells stories about places where there's a shrine you know in Japan that has been maintained for like a thousand years on a high peak that basically says this is where you should come that's all pretty much and and it was because when a tsunami hits that's actually where people survived actually just recently but survived hundreds of years ago and so she she looks at kind of how society tries to be good ancestors how we can be good ancestors and i i i loved gary's point that you shouldn't be just doing science because you love it you should be actually it's a moral you you need to explain this why it's important to society and actually think about it and then your point about what francis said it could be an act of love, which is such a different story than I ever hear from people who talk about the classic kind of science pursuit of knowledge, you know, or whatever. So I, I just love that. Um, I'm going to grab one more book. Mandy, what was your uh, reaction to what Gary said or, or just the conversation so far? Yeah, well, I mean, just this idea of you know, some of the ways that we think about science and knowledge in, in rigid ways, but I was just reflecting, you know, the human element of creativity and how the two married together are, is what is really powerful, right? The disciplined way of thinking and the way of leveraging knowledge, but in a very creative way. And I, I think about, you know, working on qu quantum computers on a daily basis, how important this creativity is. Yes, mm. mastering and understanding the best known theory at the time, but adding to building on that, experimenting. And so I think it's really beautiful, the world of science to see these things coming together. And I I think like I feel like we're missing an element of that in society to go back to to Peter's question. You know, I, I you know, how, how can we reintroduce this? And I was, I was just thinking like we've we seem to have like moved on from this era of grand challenges that unite us all and thinking about mm. science. And I think, you know, putting a man on the moon or the Manhattan Project, these grand challenges that really, mm. you know, maybe there's other organizations, but government is really well positioned to not only cast the vision, but actually put the resources behind it. So a diverse group of people can participate in realizing, you know, these, these, these grand challenges, realizing solutions to these grand challenges. So I was, mm. as you were talking, I was thinking about those two things. Well, and you know, a lot of times um, government's gotten a bad rap. Uh, and in some ways it's because if you think about it, it's like, we know how to do it on this dimension. Yes, we know how to do it. No, we don't know how to do it. Um, and on this dimension is, can we make money? Can we make money? No, we don't. It's not about money. It might be about something else. And where it's like, we can make money and we know how to do it. We call that Walmart. We call that Amazon. We call that Google. We make money. We know how to do it. It's, it's there's a clear path from, I was a startup and I died. A whole bunch of startups died, but clearly they either become Google or they die, but it's a seeking, searching of how to do it, how to make money. But for government, we sort of say, do we know how to go to another planet? Uh, no, actually, we don't. Can we make money? We don't know yet. I mean, that's called the Apollo program. We, I, we're not even sure if it's made of green cheese, you know? And so we, we give all the hardest problems in some respects. Do we know how to do universal health care? Do we know how to make money from it? No, I don't actually think we do. Do we know how to build a, a series of roads that cross the nation or a series of tubes that connect the world in the form of the internet? Mm, not at the time, which is actually why collective action in the form of taxpayer funded efforts by not only our country, other countries helped us do something that was you know, Bell Labs weaving the world. And they actually, because they were seen as a monopoly, said for $25,000, you could have all of our IP for this crazy stuff called GPS, laser, uh, you know, transistor, computing, because our mission is, you know, co connect the world. And I, so I think we give government all the worst, hardest, intractable, complex problems. And then we go, wait, you don't know how to deliver mail to everybody? You don't know how to, and make money? You don't know how to, you know, and it's not about money. Everything we do in society isn't about money. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm on like a bit of a rant, but I am so passionate about all of these quadrants. Yes, startups should matter. Yes, government should matter. Yes, private industry should should reduce the cost and get it to a lot more people, you know, and and be able to scale it. But there, but we don't have all the connections, you know. And I and I'm 
I was kind of excited about off of an era that has been all of these challenges anti-government since the Reagan administration, yeah. right? When government is the problem, and and then mm -hmm. it's not exactly. And, and and one of the other points that Gary uh, made to us is, the, or, or maybe Zach was making it making this point to us yesterday. Um, there was a very tight relationship between science and the presidency from Roosevelt through Truman, mm. Johnson. Okay, then Nixon becomes president and we start dealing with the environment and climate and there's a misalignment. Like you don't really want to hear those stories, right? And then mm. and, and then in the, the Trump administration, this was especially true. And this was one of his points about COVID, which was because there was a narrative that the political world wanted to hear, science coming up with things was kind of was 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 kind of cast aside. So th this becomes. Yeah, kind it of would a, sound better if a hurricane hit over there. Can you just change it? And apparently, Noah did change it. Like the National Institute of Graphic, they were like kowtowed by power and personal gain. What uh. one of the things that's interesting, and I think Mandy highlighted this a little bit, that you know mm. we now um, recognize certain things as being what science does, versus right science is a critical way of of, of thinking. <laughs> Yep. Um, as a as a as a certain type of disciplinary or disciplined um, posture, if, if you think about that as more of a, a you know a, a tool set or disposition you can use across a wide variety uh, of problems, that makes yeah. you start to see. I think uh, actually uh, Arthi Prakabar spoke about this in the essay that you mentioned earlier, right? Of these mm. these uh, science that's in, inspired by by problems. It doesn't mean that everything needs to be an applied. Uh, science problem, but rather we can find challenges that are, um, you know, really well positioned to begin to bring these type this type of thinking to it. But also, we can't do it alone, right? Like science can't do it alone, and rethinking science, big, you know, big S science in terms of the way it's institutionalized, um, will will come from from thinking about how these boundaries have have um, you know have blocked us in the past. Like, why don't we have embedded research units? Within many of these existing agencies, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. We lost sight of this, right? These interdependencies, and, and to go back and and look at you know, the evolution of Silicon Valley and how closely tied that was to government. To like now, the the, the thinking is, you know, we're going to be fast followers of industry, but but that model doesn't work with frontier technology that might work with software and we tend to like now equate technology with software but there's like really deep difficult hard problems the government needs to be at the table like we we have we all have things that we're good at like leverage the best of industry leverage the best of government and figure out how we can create this ecosystem where we can really advance the things that are critically important Maybe and then well, I do think that, that was brought up by sorry, Gary Megan. And our viewer, Jim Armstrong, also brought it up. Jim asked, how do you change 33% of the population that isn't so bought into the scientific method? And Gary's great mm -hmm. wish when I said, you know, what policy thing would you do? He said, I throw out the whole curriculum if people just had critical thinking. Um, you've been doing this work with iGEM, and I'd love to hear from both of you. Mm -hmm. How do we bring critical thinking, the scientific method, as a philosophy approach to life as opposed to kind of more mystical stuff that seems to be taking more charge in our country? Um, I think part of this is realizing that like we exercise these types of skills, you know, all, all the time, right? There's a, uh, we talk about the skills that are useful in science and often like they, they are these childlike skills of, right? Like thinking about the way things work, trying things out, learning from them. Um, and so, you know, with, with iGEM and some of these other places, um, it's been, recognizing that these, you know, small teams that are amateurs that are working in their community um, and, and rather than thinking like science needs to profess things to others, <laughs> it's something that yeah. you can, um, you can participate part of. In, in, a, in a variety of ways. And, um, and I also want to mention that while we've talk, been talking about science and engineering, you know, we often talk about natural science and engineering, but most of my team and the, the, um, the questions that I'm interested in lately, they're, there's folks coming from a variety of different disciplines, right? That aren't, um, and and some of these, there's a lot of different types of of um, skill sets that are going to be required and ways of thinking. So mm -hmm. again, reflecting what Mandy was saying earlier, like we we all have blind sets as we have our mm -hmm. <laughs> blinders as we have our focus areas, and we're going to need yeah. we're going to need that that uh, that combination. Right. You just remind me of another book I want to recommend for the quarantine book club this week. I don't know if you've read Range. And um, I just finished reading it. 
uh, David Epstein wrote a lot about um, sports. And what he noticed was, you know, Tiger Woods, everybody would cite Tiger Woods. He was like four years old and the dad like would balance him on his hand. And he was like zeroed in on a very particular problem for his whole life. And everyone would be like, that's what you should do. Management theory was like, be like Tiger Woods. Look at the thing, look at the this, whatever. And then he said, well, what about Rafa Nadal? Like, wh what about the fact that he didn't actually want to get into tennis, even though he won, you know, Wimbledon and things like that? He didn't actually go into tennis. He tried out a whole bunch of different things. And so in range, they studied how having range across different things, how actually putting on, as Megan said, putting on the hat of being a scientist. It's a way of looking at the world. You could also put on the hat of being a designer, put on the hat of being an ethicist, you know, but but we have to put on a hat called accounting when we balance our checkbook. That doesn't mean we're like the most amazing mathematician ever. That means that like just it's a good tool for life. And as Gary said, numeracy, like there's a difference between one and a hundred risk and one and a million risk. And and so what David Epstein did was he said he actually he did a, a study of all the different people that were narrowed down really early in life and those that were actually given the chance to be kind of across a different thing. And what he found was actually they were much more diverse in the way they looked at things because they learned these different tool sets. But then when they fell in love with something, they like went right up because they actually understood how to apply those other intelligences to this. And that's why Rafael Nadal is actually more the rule than the exception. And Tiger Wood is the exception. And so Range talks about pie-shaped people, not T-shaped people. So a lot of the culture around, you know, interdisciplinary stuff is T-shaped. And that's the idea of jack of all trades, really wide, and master of none. Or T-shaped is master of one. You like, Mandy, you spent a long time you know, in, in the Air Force, you, you went all the way down to the ground, right? You couldn't look away from this stuff. You couldn't be an armchair critic. You knew everything, gritty, <laughs> deep in that T shape, right? But you could also say, I don't know enough in, Air, in the Air Force or in this effort. I need to go up and over and look at some other mountain, look at some other range and learn how someone else is doing it. Pie shaped, which is what David Epstein is talking about, is actually like the person who co-founded, is it Tom? I, I'm sorry, I feel bad, Megan. Who co-founded Ginkgo? Oh, Tom, uh, yeah. What's his name? Tom Knight. So tell us the story about Tom Knight real quick, because I, I watched the iGEM kickoff I think and this, he told his story to the kids. Yeah, I mean, Tom's better at, at, at telling his, his story than I am, but it, it is an example of somebody who had, you know, a whole life and huge you know contributions in computing and then later on, the career just had a whole nother career. <laughs> but how old was he when he when he changed? He like he was like down in one, so T shaped. But then he came up, and then suddenly he fell in love with biology, and he was over fifty. Oh yeah, I'm old. not sure yeah. exactly, but he's one of the co-founders of um, so it's like Ginkgo Bioworks, which is um, a, a company that really came out of this uh, this iGEM competition in in many ways. It was one of the first. It's teams. a unicorn. It's amazing right now. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, well, especially in light of, of this moment, right? They've they've now grown um, to scale up and professionalize that same idea of building, you know, custom biological organisms for any purpose. And so when this, you know, when COVID occurred, it was like this is the this is the moment where we're waking up to the power of biology, both uh, its you know our vulnerabilities to small bits of biology, but also the need to use these these systems, um, but their ability to then turn uh, and create this, you know, uh, platform that can quickly pivot to COVID response, which is what they've they've done, or lend out their uh, their platform to uh, testing, or actually around the Moderna vaccine around um, yeah. around that platform. Um, but was because the imagination of what a, a bio foundry would look like is drawing analogies from previous fields, right? Of a okay. Foundry, silicon foundry, and yeah, and in right. fact, they teamed up with Zymergen, and they're like actually coming up with bio-inspired ways of doing new kinds of electronics, and uh, and they have, by the way, they have designers on staff and artists on staff uh, because of this, you know, um, and and have explored like how, how they have designer on staff that explored how to bring back a flower that was extinct, and smell it again. 
And, and, and that may sound crazy and dumb, but actually artists, and I know Peter would being the chairman of gray area and all that has been very passionate about how artists are sometimes our first pioneers because they are in the moment. They're, they don't, they, their job is to not, you know. And as you found when you were at Autodesk. Their, their own exploration. As you found yeah. at Autodesk with artists and residents, as you invent tools, the tools have yeah. a purpose, which is just kind of why you invented it. And artists wouldn't know from that. And this is a little bit what you were making describing. And the right they, they, they go the around world. corners. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and I think this is particularly true at a cross-disciplinary moment, right, where you have different tools, different materials, different ideas, and how they're combined uh, is what leads to innovation and flourishing. And in a way, it brings us back to one of Bush's original insights. When he, when he did As We May Think, he saw there's so much science and so much depth being created that you'll have all these experts that know their thing and nothing else. And he was like, we need a corpus callosum. How the hell do we hook everybody up so that people find each other's knowledge? And of course, we have two answers to that today. The web got created, but now we have quarantine, which today has clearly been a corpus callosum across <laughs> biology, quantum computing, uh, artificial intelligence, and the past. Uh, real quick, Mandy, you just put up something that was quantum music. Uh, I don't know, Amit, if you can put that in the bottom third or a ticker tape. What? Tell us just a, a, a sentence or two. Uh, well, one of the first uses of our quantum computer for, for some of our beta users was um, a person that uh, is a musician and uses the pattern seen in quantum computing to create his music. So uh, it's just uh, inspiring. I, I remember one of our all hands, uh, he came and he was able to play some of his music. And it's pretty neat to think wow. of all the applications. What did it sound like? What? <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, 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 um, I don't know how to, how to describe it. I mean, there's there's a, a randomness to it. It's um it's uh, it's pretty cool. I mean, like it's it's uh you you can find. I, I have to look at the YouTube. There's a YouTube uh, yeah. where it's recorded it as yeah. well. But yeah, it's. I mean, it's almost eerie in some ways. Like it's it's just it's cool to see it come to life. The patterns in quantum computing come alive. Mm. You know, I think oh, it's Friday right night. We need to like let let Megan and Mandy go. I feel I feel bad. I was I just wanted to recognize that that Mandy has I think inspired a new way to end this show, which is show and tell. Like everyone brings uh, something unexpected and cool, and we do show and tell like school. Music, yeah. and then we can all go home. <laughs> what or a book? What what's inspiring both of you? And then get the heck out and go have a weekend because it's been a long, glorious, weird week. But any any last words or books or recommendations for our audience or just things that get you excited? I um, like Mandy just did, yeah. Yeah, lately. Um, so one of the other efforts I've participated in for a number of years is um, an organization called Revive and Restore, and they're um, working on um, using biotechnology and in, in conservation and the idea of, of genetic rescue. And you want to talk about you know hard problems on really really long time scales, <laughs> um, and thinking about what are um, what are uses of, of technology for really um, non in many ways non human purposes right <laughs> to benefit the planet to bring back endangered and ex and extinct species and so that is a as a question of our responsibilities of the uses of our technology of how we think about our relationship. Um, with the with the living world has for me been uh, just a, a wonderful place to um, reflect and also uh, try out some like, things. If anyone is watching this, look up Revive and Restore, like, and look up the quantum music. The interesting thing about your comment about Revive and Restore, of course, is that um, earlier, uh, Zach mentioned as the biographer, two papers, uh, the new, uh, The Endless Frontier, and as we may think, and then Doug Engelbart created this thing from as we may think, which was this notion of could we have augmented human thinking? Could could we actually pass on our knowledge and be able to do this? And he created something called the mother of all demos. And the project manager for the mother of all demos, I just figure I'll do a little game of connection, was a guy named Stuart Brand. And Me Megan, what does Stuart Brand have to do with revive and restore? So uh, Revive and Restore was um, sort of incubated as a program within the Long Now Foundation, um, which, mm. which 
Stewart is the president of, and so, and is on the on the board of Revive and Restore with with me as well. Um, and you know, if you think about you know folks who really challenged um, challenged our our notions of of thinking and and um, at various stages and has led a different type of career. Stewart's one you know one example of that. Um, and uh, and you know again just like thinking about these nonlinear paths um, and also. Um, on as we get back to the beginning of the show, right? What are the the time scales of of the legacies that we will leave, right? The the this charge to land or others is right. Like think about charting the paths for the next seventy five years. But clearly, the things we're doing today, right, <laughs> extend mm -hmm. far beyond that. And in seventy five years, I expect we'll be having a very different conversation about science and engineering. And so uh, today has been a really fun chance to, to think about that, so thank you. So last little note, I, I noticed a few people on our comments from LinkedIn. Mark Daner was actually one of the founding members of Maker of, of uh, Tech Shop. And Tech Shop, he was the, 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 the brilliant person who worked with a guy named Mark Hatch to actually start seeding this, this, this almost like a, a health club for making where you could go and actually go to San Francisco, go to Arizona, go to DC, go to go to different places and actually walk in and on a weekend, you could learn how to use a lathe or or a 3D printer or a water jet cutter. And Mark Daner's tuned in today because he would actually orchestrate the crazy real estate deals to actually figure this out. Um, and he said, tinkers with shift professions are key paradigm shifters. And I, I just think that's wonderful. And it's wonderful. Thank you, Mark, for tuning in. Because uh, you are you've just been an inspiration in terms of thinking about how to deploy in a in a city and build something that allows a community to learn how to make and create and play. Um, and then uh, Heike has said yes, plus one to show and tell and quantum revival. Um, Heike got a chance to tour Rigetti. Uh, and Mandy got a chance to to let her hold and see a quantum chip and everything. Uh, I don't know what quantum revival means, um, but I, I like the sound of it. It sounds like we're gonna we're gonna do a, like a barn raising. We're gonna do like a let's get it together. Um, and and the first quantum computing that really infect or quantum science that impacted us was GPS. It's why we actually have the ability to find ourselves in Google Map. This is this is like the next wave. The quantum revival 2.0, what you're working on, Mandy. Uh, <laughs> anyway, very fun. I, I just thank you so much for joining us, and and good luck. This is a hard, interesting year, but I just I'm a big fan. I look forward to our future dinner party in in person. All in of us. Person. Yeah. yeah, I can't wait. I'll, I'll just toast remotely. <laughs> With whatever you got. Apparently, now it's time for show and tell. Uh, yeah. um, I, I have something to show. Omid, can we bring up the letterhead? <laughs> this, so I wanted to share with you Vannevar Bush's actual letterhead uh, that he was using in 1948, um, which, which, there we go. And what's great is his letterhead was National Military Establishment Research and Development Board, which, first of all, what a great title. And secondly, there it was born in whole cloth, the, the entire research and development establishment, the military industrial complex. So just hats off to, 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 to Bush for that. Also, uh, okay, we can take that off, I mean. Um, you know, this bit about engaging the public in scientific responsibility, uh, which we're having, you know, that's like this week's conversation. It's important to know that in that era, the atomic scientists who of course knew for a couple of years what was coming and then were very concerned about the actual use of the weapon the within days after the atomic bomb was dropped in in almost every op-ed was a national conversation realizing this was an existential problem that that mm. uh, th th that if we didn't control this thing we might lose population or we lose control of things. And that became kind of a global conversation. And in fact, when Stimson and um, first informed President Roosevelt of the atomic bomb, the letter from, from him and General Groves, in addition to saying, we've built the bomb, you're gonna drop it, the war will end. They said, we're not here to tell you that. What we're here to tell you is if we can't control it, the world will end. So that's your political problem, Mr. President. And in 1946, One World or None, which is now part of our book club, written 
by oh, Oppenheimer and Bohr's and Beta, all were saying we have to come to grips with this stuff. So it's hmm. science. All right, so Peter's giving us a book as well. <laughs> I think it's Friday. What time is it, Peter? We got to kick everybody out and go go have a weekend. Thank you, Megan. You know, Thank I would you, normally Andy. tell you it's six or eight <laughs> quarantine and we can get off. But given quantum entanglement, actually, we'll never know. We'll never know. Who knows? And so, <laughs> thanks for joining. I'm not even going to take a stab at what time it is because there's no. a number of options there. It's relative. But we'll see you next week. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. This has been a delight. Bye-bye. <laughs>